welcome to the AZ Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Hamid Chojai. Arizona's tech ecosystem is rapidly growing with incredible companies that are shaping our future. Every week, I sit down and talk with some of the people who are making an impact in this critical sector of Arizona's economy. All right, let's go. All right, I'm uh, here with CEO of Parchment, Matthew Patinsky. Hey, Matt, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be here. Likewise, it's good to see you after a Big, uh, I mean, we haven't seen each other pre-COVID, but even before then, it's it had been a while. Yeah, we had sort of this thing going with the um, startup sort of conferences down at Sky Song, so it's yeah. been too long. Oh yeah, those were super fun. I haven't I haven't been to one of those forever, and I guess maybe because you know because we stopped haven't doing, hosted them. Yeah, yeah. Because we stopped doing them. <laughs> I mean, you usually you have to be the host yeah. of your own party. That, that's right. I forgot that we were the ones doing those uh, those events. We should bring them back. That was a lot of fun. It is, and I think it's part of helping. I mean, this podcast is awesome, but it's part of helping to create that tech community as a chance for people to come together in normal times. Yeah, yeah, totally. So your big uh, claim to fame, besides Parchment, which is an incredibly successful um, software, or uh, very successful software company, we'll come back to Parchment, but your claim to fame is a product called Blackboard, which basically everyone going to college in the past 20 years has probably ran across and familiar with. Either they have cursed you at some point in time. Fair <laughs> or, enough, fair enough. Or they have been like, oh my God, this is amazing. And uh, both of those experiences and some spectrum in, in between has been uh, part of the Blackboard story. And uh, you are a co-founder of Blackboard, right? Tell, uh, tell us, let's start with the Blackboard story, if you don't mind, because I think that's such a fascinating story. Yeah, so it's sort of like the wonder years. We'll go back to, uh, to 1997. I was 24 years old, about a year or two out of college. And uh, my college roommate, Mike Chasen, and I were working together at KPMG Consulting, which is sort of, you know, it's KPMG, it's this huge firm. Yeah. But we were generally working with universities helping them set up these big administrative systems, like the things that produce your transcripts and schedule classes and all that good stuff, the enterprise software. Right. And it occurred to us that universities were spending millions of dollars to wire up their dorms. Back then, it was a port per pillow. And students were playing video games like Doom and Duke Nukem, which will definitely uh, date me. But you had all of this network infrastructure, all of this technology focused on the back office of the university, nothing really for the front office for teaching and learning. Okay. And it was that kernel of idea that made us wonder in an internet age, what would education look like online? And most of all, what would faculty need to make it obscenely easy for them to be able to offer a class online? And that was the inspiration of, of Blackboard. And, and remind us what, uh, and this is going to date both of us, but like uh, remind us what it was like for when we were going to school, how we turned in homework assignments and things prior to Blackboard, right? Yeah, and you talk about <laughs> sort of that, you know, people may have cursed it, people may have loved it. Like early on. People loved it. The idea that you could like hand in your assignments online and the faculty member didn't have to hand out their syllabus and you could just download it or you could post a question on a discussion board, things that seem so basic and simple, right. were really transformative. Yeah. Um, and so that was the early version of the product, was just very basic classroom management capabilities, communication capabilities. Without that, you know, a snow day was a snow day. You didn't, well, and I don't want to be responsible for the death of snow days, <laughs> but a snow day was a snow day. Right. You didn't go into class, and if you missed the class, it was difficult to get the notes, and, you know, teachers handing out tons of paper and everybody losing it, and so we started to bring a lot of that online. Yeah, uh, and and when you guys created the product, what was the curve of adoption? What did that look like? And like, tell, tell us how you started Blackboard. Yeah, I think there are two early lessons. One is you often have this chicken and the egg where you can't raise money unless you have a product and you can't build the product unless you raise the money, right? <laughs> right. And one of the ways that you can crack that chicken and the egg is through consulting. So if you can, now you don't want to sort of get lost into a whole sort of side gig, yeah. but if you can find a way through services to kind of build that first generation, then you've got an amazing opportunity to bootstrap off of consulting services. So that's what we did. We were able to find a consortium of universities that were interested in learning technologies to engage us to build kind of an early version of what we imagined a learning management system can do. And then the second lesson is we too often think of competitors as competitors, and sometimes they're partners. They're equally passionate about building within the category. Right. And so within a year of starting, 
we came across these guys at Cornell University, and they were all guys, um, at Cornell University who were getting ready to graduate, and they had built something very similar to what we imagined Blackboard would be for Cornell and for those faculty. And so we convinced them to merge with us. And it was about a year later, so around June of 1998, that all of a sudden we had Cornell as a customer. We had a reasonably good product market fit from what they had built for Cornell. But at the same time, we had Mike and I's experience. We had an angel investor. We had the consulting and the credibility of those universities. And that was kind of the magic the kind of together. scale that sort of came together that allowed us to take off. So I often advise entrepreneurs early on, yeah, it's good to have rivals that you're passionate about competing against, but talk to them because you never know bringing your two organizations together can be the thing that kind of gets you going, you, the catalyst to get yeah. you going, exactly. Like it, uh, one plus one equals three type of thing as opposed to just adding customers together. Now you become a market leader and you know, like the, the acceleration becomes exponential as opposed to just linear. Yeah, and you've got a team of founders. Right. Like one of the jokes about Blackboard is there's so many people who describe themselves as co-founders. Oh. And that's one of the and that's one of the reasons because you had all of these co-founders of the Cornell Cornell product and then you yeah. had Mike and I from Blackboard. And even though the company stayed on as Blackboard Inc., um, you know, I give them I mean they are equally the co-founders of the business certainly as I am. And what an amazing thing to be able to have your first and again they're not this, but to have yeah. your first 5 or 10 employees all be founders. All be founders. All yeah. have that level of ownership and passion and excitement and product vision and, um, yeah, and put it all together. So I'm sure that also brought a lot of challenges with it because, you know, like once you have two people, it's already sort of like divergence of thoughts and opinions. When you have three, four, five, six, is how much exponentially harder does it become? It, it, it does. Um, I think the secret is the things that they loved, I hated. The things that I loved, they hated. So if you want to gnaw your arm off and get out of the room, you know, when you're getting into financials and someone <laughs> else can't wait for that part of the meeting to start, then you've got a good partnership. So the Cornell team was just obscenely good at product market fit. They had a very good sense of the feature set, the interface, right. the design. So a lot of the um, the product magic of, of Blackboard very much was came from that Cornell um, Mike Chasen, my co-founder, was just really good at running a business. And who would have thought that your college roommate could scale through an IPO and beyond? But he absolutely has done that. And his wow. latest company, Class Technologies, is just exploding. Um, and then for me, it was much more about education. So my background is in education. That's what I'm passionate about. That's the through line of my, of my career. And so I was hopefully good at sort of mapping out the market strategy and the brand and the growth strategy and sort of who are we, what do we do, who do we do it for, and what's going to really differentiate us in the market strategically, and that yeah. was a lot of my responsibility. Your uh, parents uh, were in education as well, which is why your background was in education to some degree, I suspect. I want to come back to that, though. Let's put, put a pin in that one uh, because I want to continue to talk about the Blackboard story. So in 98, you guys merged, and it's starting to take off. At what point did you guys raise real money and – what did that look like, and what, what was that experience like? Yeah, so in, in so we started in June of 97. We've got a year of doing the consulting and sort of bootstrapping a little bit. Uh, we went so far as, and I tell this story a lot, but we, we stole our chairs. <laughs> so one of my lessons to entrepreneurs is, is you got to be willing to steal the chair, which is an awkward lesson because it's a little bit of, and obviously with Theranos in the news, you know, that's an extreme <laughs> example of the fake it till you make it. Right. But sometimes you do do things a little bit on the ethical edge where you're saying, you know, oh, yeah, no, it's, it, it does all that, and it's just two weeks from release, and we're going to get going. And again, with Theranos, we're talking about people's lives and, right. you know, a whole different scale. So the stealing the chair, because um, we really bootstrapped everything, you know this, but what we learned very quickly on our first day shopping for furniture for a new office, which was basically one room in a brownstone that we rented from a law firm, who, by the way, gave us all the utilities and had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> Once we started setting up servers and all the air conditioning started to come down, oh, that's as, uh, as our we could tell the traffic on the server based on the air conditioning, um, is the desks are not very expensive, but the chairs are super expensive. Yeah, yeah. $1,000 so, for a chair, 400 bucks for, for a desk. For a desk, or whatever. so yeah. you know of what I speak. <laughs> So we had gotten permission from our partner at KPMG to borrow our uh, computers for about a week or two before we could, uh, before we could um, to get them in the mail. Um, 
And he gave us a permission slip, and these were desktops, and they were heavy, so we put them on the chairs, along with whatever our personal artifacts were. You know where this is going. <laughs> so we're rolling it down, and we hit security, and hopefully no one from KPMG is listening to this, but it, they're 30-year-old chairs. They've been depreciated. Um, but we're rolling down, and we're getting to security, and obviously security sees the computers. Like, what are you doing rolling out with computers? Right. Show them the permission slip. They never noticed the chairs. Yeah. So we, we roll the chairs out. We had this just amazing moment in Washington, D.C. on M Street, which is a relatively busy street, but it's like 3 in the morning. And we're just rolling the chairs down <laughs> to our offices, having a chair roll contest in the middle of the city, unload everything. And then really the sequence was that's when we went to Staples the next day discovered how expensive chairs were, came back, noticed we had the red chairs, and said, you know what? I don't think they're going to miss them. <laughs> and so to this day, in my office, we have, one, I of have my, one of my red chairs. So that first year was a lot of that kind of bootstrapping, <laughs> consulting work. I mean, we didn't steal anything else besides, uh, besides the chairs. Um, then coming across um, the Cornell team, convincing them to merge, which opened up an angel investor. Okay. Um, and now you have the angel investment, maybe 200000 You have the Cornell product. You've got sort of the brand that we're able to build it at Blackboard. You're and getting traction at this point. Starting to get traction. And gosh, I know people say this, but it just feels like a blur. So if I can zoom out for a moment, you know, 1998, all of a sudden, 2000, we raise over $125 million from private equity firms, Microsoft, Dell, AOL, a bunch of Pearson, a bunch of strategic investors. Between 98 and 2000. And uh, in 2004. Okay. We go public in 2004 and then eventually get taken private again in 2010. And to be an interesting interviewer, I will try to remember, or interviewee, I will try to remember things a long way, but all of a sudden then it just feels like this incredible blur. So I got to tell you, I, and I, I don't know if I've shared this story with you before. So between 98 and 2000, when you guys, or I think it was 2000 actually, when you guys got a $10 million investment from Microsoft, another 10 million from Dell. Yeah. I think it was part of like a Dell, Microsoft sort of like uh, strategy to try to get Blackboard converted from the open source That's technology. That's exactly so it was, what it was, <laughs> yeah. Right, like you guys ran on like Linux and, yeah. um, I had just started working for Microsoft and Microsoft Microsoft Consulting Services. Um, I was in the Microsoft Consulting Services group, and Microsoft wanted to make sure that the Blackboard project was going to be a success, and their big showcase was going to be ASU. So that was my project. <laughs> Why didn't you ever tell me this? Or maybe you did. That's hysterical. Uh, but, so, Small world. So yeah. So like basically between uh, my first big project in 2001 was to. Um, make sure that Blackboard was going to be successful at ASU when they went live in fall. So for seven months, we had this sort of big project to sort of make sure every aspect of the project was was coming along. And sure enough, in August, when we went live with Blackboard on uh, Dell computers and SQL Server, Microsoft Windows, yeah. all that stuff, the whole system came to a halt because it was not scalable enough to take 40,000 students on the Microsoft Dell platform. So it was a disaster. Well, and so, it's kind uh, of you to say the Microsoft Dell platform. I wonder how much of it was also the, the Blackboard well, you know, I mean, you I know, think, server architecture. But yeah, yeah, I think it wasn't architected to run well on because, you know, with Oracle or um, Sun Microsystems, which was the alternative stuff, you could yeah. just throw hardware and software, at, uh, like scalable stuff at it that just ran the 40,000 people without a problem, but... Um, so we are dating ourselves, right? Yeah. So for those at home, believe it or not, before the cloud, yeah. enterprise software was installed locally on yeah. servers. And, and um, Sun Microsystems. You know, today, if someone asked me the tech stack of parchment, I'm like, I could start listing it, but the tech stack is like, right? I mean, there's so many modules and components, yeah. so many elements and of the architecture. And everything is probably like in AWS now. Yeah, and everything is platform as a service or what have you. But back then, if you asked me what the architecture was, it was the database, right? It was the server operating system. Right. And then it was the server-side programming language. And we were largely Linux, um, a little bit of Solaris, but largely yeah. Linux and um, I guess MySQL? My, uh, and Oracle. Or maybe it was Oracle. Yeah. For for scale, I think it was Oracle. Yeah. But for smaller installations, it was MySQL. Yeah, it was MySQL. And so, yeah, that was very much why uh, Microsoft invested was to, um, yeah, to help yeah. convert Get it. you to convert. Yeah. And ASU, I mean, ASU's been wonderful. 
they were really the first big enterprise client right. uh, for, for Blackboard. But ASU was always also very challenging because of the scale. The, just the general scale. and Yeah. You know. uh, well, I mean, what interesting memories that brings back. So so you guys raised over $100 million. What What was it like? What Was there, like, major challenges with the founders as a result of, like, having access to an incredible, incredible amount of money? Or did that actually help smooth things out? You, you know, what was your sort of experience with that? Yeah, I don't think it was a founder dynamic. I mean, we were always very lucky. We've always gotten along. We still get along. And some of the founders have gone on to create companies like Wedding Wire, which is the huge, you know, uh, e-commerce website uh, for weddings. Dan Kane has gone off to create Modernizing Medicine, which is this huge success in healthcare. So a bunch of, and then most people have stayed within education. We've always gotten along. We've always had very complementary skills and, and interests. What it really allowed us to do is, you know, our playbook was land and expand. So right. our playbook was get individual faculty to fall in love with it. And if you have the faculty fall in love with it, if they design their classroom experience around it, then you would be in the best position to win the enterprise relationship. Right. Because early on, e-learning was still very novel. Right. And so a lot of universities were adopting at the department level. They were adopting subscale. How, how so we had to have like a 5,000, 7,500 a year type licensing model with the idea that over time we'd be able to build up to the whole campus licensing at ACVs of, of 50 or 55,000. And so that's hard, though, to have the sort of full organizational capabilities of an enterprise software company when you're doing local deployments and stalls right. and consulting and support and integration but you're doing it at lower ACVs right. with the premise that you'd be able to expand. So it just allowed us to sort of build ahead of, of where our recurring revenues and, were. And this is pre-SAS. So how, like, how, when a department or a particular class professor or whatever loved the product and wanted to do it, it's not like they could do it without hardware, right? Like they would have to actually have hardware that There was runs. No, no magical upsell button. There was no <laughs> sort of share a code. With your CIO, yeah, we just had to, we would visit. Um, so we had a, a, a central website called blackboard.com where individual faculty could create their courses. And then that would tell us where there's activity in terms of a campus. And then okay. we would visit the academic computing department and say, or the dean, and say, hey, I don't know if you realize this, but all your faculty are teaching and learning online. Wow. On this other website, you probably want it integrated with your student information system. You probably don't want your PII sitting you know, on blackboard.com, right. your, your private information, you really should set up a local server and get going. And then depending on their level of commitment, we could start them at the department level and, and grow them. But it was all enterprise software. But fun fact, we were actually the first company to go public, first enterprise software company to go public with a subscription model. Because oh, we wow. went public before Salesforce. And, and what, what year was that? And that was 2004. 2004. So and early on, we had to explain to investors I mean, there were none of these metrics. There was no, nothing called ARR. There was yeah. nothing called MRR, yeah. LTV. None of those things existed. <laughs> so we, and, and the only reason why we got there was because we failed at selling a big ticket. So we would go in right. and say, certainly your learning is as enterprise as your administrative systems. So if you're spending half a million dollars in your administrative systems, that's what you should do with us. And then they would come back and say, no, 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 we, we just can't yeah, do that. The students are not that important. Yeah, the students aren't <laughs> that important. Well, and academic computing was sort of the, you know, the stepchild. And so he said, all right, well, how about you pay us 50000 a year? Right. I'm like, well, that we can do. We can get it in our operating budget. We can't do it as this big capital expense. Right, right. And then very quickly, we started to see the virtue of, you know, of that recurring revenue. But it made us seem like we were growing much slower than every other software company, because every other software company would recognize these big upfront perpetual licenses with a small amount of recurring maintenance, and we were much more amortized in our revenue through the subscriptions. Yeah. I know I'm getting a little bit geeky here. No, but, that, but that's throughout our fundraising, we always seem to be growing smaller. And then we have this big thing called deferred revenue, which is a liability. Like, what is that? And we said, well, let me explain to you. We go into a year with 97% of our revenues visible on day one. Right. And then they're like, holy cow. Yeah, because like the stability comes yeah. from that. I mean, that's why the whole market transition to SaaS is because of the stability of that recurring revenue. Yeah, and we completely stumbled into it because we yeah. simply failed at selling a more traditional kind of, you know, upfront license plus, How plus services model. Yeah. And then eventually the SaaS model became much more valuable and got higher multiples. So when you guys went public, what was the valuation, roughly speaking? 
Oh, gosh, that's a good question. So we were growing very fast. We were growing about 50%, 45 to 50%. We were probably approaching $100 million of revenues. Okay. Um, and then ARR would have been higher than that. But again, we didn't have that. It never occurred to us to sort of describe the NTM value of our recurring contracts. Um, I think we went public at maybe $350 million or so. Wow. That that's such a low multiple in today's this is a different term. Time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, isn't that crazy? Time. Like right now, a hundred million dollar ARR company would get twenty times that uh, in terms of multiple. Like two billion dollar valuation would be the typical, you know, like uh, fast growing SaaS company that's going public, right? Yeah, hundred million revenue, two billion valuation. That's probably on the low side of things, even, uh, which is kind of crazy. What what year did you leave uh, Blackboard? So I, um, I officially left with the sale. So I was chairman of the board as a publicly traded company um, at the time that we sold to, um, to Providence Equity. But probably it stopped an operating role about two years earlier. What so, year, w- roughly? So that would have been 2007, 2008-ish. Okay. Um, and that was largely so that I could finish my PhD. No, actually it would have been earlier than that. Sorry. It would have been more like 2006. And that was largely so that I could finish my PhD. And uh, so in between Blackboard and uh, Parchment, I was a tenure track professor at ASU in the sociology program. And that's what I always imagined my life would be, would be a professor. So after we started Blackboard, like three months later, I took the GREs. That's how <laughs> high my confidence was. And I'm speaking sarcastically that we would ever be around. And then obviously Blackboard worked out and kind of kept me there much longer. So since Blackboard did work out and you were there and you're now running a, uh, helping run a public company, you're a co-founder in this company, multi-hundred million dollar success story, what made you think that like, okay, I want to go get my PhD? Like wh- why was that such an important aspect of uh, your life that you would leave the company you co-founded? Yeah, I think it's just, that's one of the most difficult decisions you can possibly make, right? And you know you don't want to leave when it's too late. When you start getting frustrated, you know, thinking about the entrepreneur story. Right. We never had founder tension. I mean, we had arguments. Mike and I would have huge arguments. But we ultimately knew the lanes that we would, you know, sort of work within. And I knew when I deferred to him. And he knew when he uh, deferred to me um, and the rest of the team. But as we went, you know, as a public company, it, it really is. You're living quarter by quarter. Yeah. You have to deliver a financial envelope within an absurd level of precision. Um, investing organically becomes more and more challenging for that reason, to tell the street that we're going to hold you know, our EBITDA margin expansions. You know, we're going to hold EBITDA margins constant in order to fund this and that. You know, it just gets lost in the noise. Yeah. When Blackboard was taken private, we were either the number one or number two shorted stock on the entire NASDAQ. Holy cow. I don't know if that's something I should be. Uh, so they got screwed because we went private at a very nice valuation. Um, but just you, And so then M&A becomes key. I mean, that's the simplest way to grow right. is to acquire as opposed to funding it. But then a lot of your time is spent around M&A integration. And to make a long story short, you start to feel constrained yeah. in the things that you're passionate about, including parchment. I mean, parchment in many ways was an unfinished idea from Blackboard days that I'd wanted to execute within Blackboard and just we could never create the space. But, but and so didn't... I think it was partly, <clears throat> if I'm getting more and more frustrated by the opportunity to really do things, and it's sort of perverse because you think, my gosh, you have this huge platform to do all of the most amazing ideas. Right. But at the same time, again, you're operating within these constraints. And there's this other thing that I know once I start having a family and kids, life intrudes, getting a PhD, that's really challenging. Yeah. Um, this is the window, okay. age-wise and otherwise, where I'm going to be able to do it. And so stepped away. But it's a really hard thing to do as an entrepreneur to step away from the company that is almost like an extension of yourself. Yeah. Um, what's fascinating about that is that you didn't step away to start something like Parchment or, you know, pursue another idea. You stepped away to go back to education. So let, let's talk a little bit. Let's bring that pin back now and talk a little bit about, like, your upbringing. Why was education such a fundamental part of your life? Uh, and Is it because of your parents or the value of education? Like, how, how was that integrated into Matthew growing up, right? Like, Yeah, I think, I mean, it may sound simple. I do think it's partly biography. 
Okay. So my mom was a teacher and my dad was a school uh, was president of our school board. Uh, thankfully, not during a global pandemic, because that's a pretty <laughs> thankless ta- task right now. Um, and then was a university administrator. I have three older brothers. One of them is a faculty member at Stony Brook. So education is always in our family. I think that's one. Two is I was not a great student. So I failed. I went to summer school twice, failed courses. Uh, thankfully, I did well on my standardized exam, but on my GPA alone, I was a terrible student. Why, and I why think, is that hard for me to believe? When you say you failed courses, do you mean you actually got an F or oh, did I you actually, get a, like a C? And, and now my kids like... can't listen to this because they think. <laughs> um, no, I, I literally got an F. Really? Um, and I think the people who are interested in education reform or education technology, a remarkable number of them just failed, disconnected, right? They just had bad grades. They had bad experiences. Right. They had a point of friction. And so they wondered why. I mean, I remember in seventh grade, there were two math teachers, both teaching the exact same material, same material, same assessments, roughly the same sequencing. And one of them was known as the hard teacher. And one of them was known as the easy teacher. And I started with the hard teacher and I was failing. And then I went into the easy teacher and I ended up getting an A in that class. And it occurred to me, one of them is a better teacher. Maybe the easy <laughs> teacher is just a good teacher. Right. And the hard teacher is just a bad teacher. Right, right. When I was in high school, and this is what really got me interested in education. Um, and what's funny is someone else involved in the story now runs actually one of our competitors. So it's a small world that someone from my same high school is in the market. Um, but we had this huge controversy over class rank. And if you're familiar with how class rank works, if you take honors classes, you get like, you don't get the 4.0, you get the 4.5 or yeah. you get some boost. And But not every class obviously is eligible for that because not every class has honors. Right. And so you had two students that were vying to be valedictorian, one of whom, who ended up the Sal, was artistic. So she took music and other classes that didn't give her that boost, whereas the person who became valedictorian didn't tend to take those classes. And so it created this big controversy of is the ranking system fair to someone who really wants to pursue these kinds of you know, interests. And so they formed a committee. And I think, and I was picked to be the um, pr- uh, sort of the common man, blue collar, like bad student representative on the committee because I wasn't in any honors classes. <laughs> and then this other kid I'm mentioning was like the honors student representative. But they thought that I was safe because, cut to the chase, the valedictorian was actually my older brother okay. and my dad was on the school board. So they're like, look, if we have to take some kid from like the regular track, Matt's the one who's going to be sympathetic to the plight of, of honors students. And I remember sitting in that committee and saying, wait a minute. Like, you're telling me you're tracking kids because this is the curriculum that's appropriate. Like, I'm in the math class because that's the curriculum that's appropriate to me. Right. But then you're turning around and telling me that when I reach a level of achievement in that relative to someone who's in honors class, and that's the curriculum that's appropriate to them, that somehow that's valued less. And it just this, it just the whole question of tracking, what does it mean to rank, just a bunch of different things sort of opened up for me. And I fell in love with education. Um, partly teaching, which is what I went to college to, to be a social studies teacher, um, but also just why schools are organized the way they are, right? Why in elementary school does one teacher teach all, most of the subjects? And then in high school, each subject is taught by a different teacher, right? A classic right. one is why does high school start earliest when it's the elementary kids who are you know, getting up earliest? Right. And there's a hundred ways in which the way our schools are organized is sort of weird. Yeah. And I just became fascinated with that. And it doesn't change, right? Like, it seems like change is extremely slow in, in K through 12 anyway. I don't, I don't know, like, um, why is that? It changes incrementally. Yeah. It changes. I mean, there are definitely things that when I look at my kids' educational experience versus mine, it, it's different. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of it is, not to get too sociological about it, but there's this, you know, a lot of the legitimacy of education comes from it looking, feeling, and tasting like what you experienced. Like in a perverse way as parents, if we're told there's a new math, (laughs) like we're bothered by that, right? If we were told- In my time. Right. (laughs) When I went to school. (laughs) Yeah, if we were told that elementary kids are gonna, you know, leave the classroom, I mean, maybe that's not the best example, but if we were told like first graders are gonna have a separate science class and whatever, you're, you're, you know, you're 
you're killing these kids. They should just have fun. I don't know. Right, right. We have these really well-worn beliefs about what school's supposed to look like, and it creates constraints, I think, to, to innovation. And then partly you want it to be, and I'm saying this as an EdTech entrepreneur, you want innovation to be at least paced. Right. Like my kid only gets third grade m- once, yeah. right? So if you just throw in some entrepreneur's new curriculum, and so, yeah, we'll try it, and maybe it has product market fit, and maybe it doesn't. Well, here, It's not quite medicine, but, here, but it matters. Here's an interesting thing that's happening with or without your approval, which is that that entrepreneur is getting to your kid anyway through social media. Yes. Right? And, and like they're spending way more time on that than they are at school. And that's a whole freaking experiment that we didn't sign up for, and we're, we're going through at mass scale. And, you, you know, like... Um, the other day, I found that like um, my 11 year old had spent seven hours on TikTok, you know, just in one day, and I was like, "This is unbelievable! That's a lot of hours." Yes. And I don't know where the end result of this experience is going to be. Experiment is going to be. And what are your thoughts about that? Like, so we're we're taking things very slowly in the academic setting, and they're feeding their ADD and you know, like attention um, starvation through you know, entrepreneurs who are feeding that through 10 second video clips and, you know, um, keeping them entertained the entire seven hours back to back, right? Yeah. Like, and our generation well, is used to the idea that the norms of a classroom and the way education works is different from, right, other parts of our lives. But the bigger that gap gets, I mean, schools aren't like churches, they're not religion, but we accept the fact that, right, that the church experience or any religious experience is going to be different, right? We're not a customer of a priest or a rabbi. We're, right. you know, so, we, so we're used to schools and teachers are in positions of authority. Schools can regulate dress. They can regulate, you know, other. apparently they can't regulate mass, but that's a different issue. <laughs> they can regulate all sorts of other things. And, but as that gap gets bigger between the consumer experience and the technology experience of students in the everyday world, And the education world, yeah, it does create this tension. But to be honest, it's also happening within the schoolhouse, right? Because how many teachers are just going outside of the school and they're taking down Class Dojo? Yeah. They're taking down Remind. They're spinning up Cami. You know, they're doing all sorts of stuff. Like my kids, as a parent, I'm almost like a systems integrator for the younger ones where they've got to read it on this one website, complete it here, do it in a PDF that's editable through this Google app you know, extension. And a lot of that is not being mediated by the school at all. Yeah. And then you have things like Duolingo, right? How many kids are adopting their own curricula through things like Duolingo, which my daughter uses to help, you know, support French class. So we're definitely in this sort of everything is kind of, everything's mixing and matching and conflating. And and, uh, to some extent, COVID helped accelerate that too, because uh, people had to go online. And they had to find the sort of best best of breed for learning math lessons and history lessons and chemistry lessons. And now they found material that's way better than their typical teacher. And, you know, like they're incorporating that into it as well. So it's, it's definitely fascinating. There's a lot of experiments that are going on that is at a pace that, you know, like it makes me uncomfortable but also excited. But also, you know, like uh, the, on the social media aspect where those entrepreneurs in particular are trying to just fight for eyeballs and they don't care what content is being served to the kids. That part worries me. And right? it should. Yeah. yeah, it should. I mean, it's ex- you know this field so much better than anyone, but these are these are addictive platforms designed to be addictive right. and that are targeting young people and it's affecting their brains. It's affecting their social life. It's affecting their mental health. And as a parent, you and I are both reasonably technical, but if your kid's doing Xbox with the Microsoft ecosystem, and then their school gives them a Google device, and then you tend to use Apple devices, it's impossible right. to create any real kind of stewardship. Right. Um, so yeah, it's it's an incredibly dynamic time to be in ed tech. And, and it's a dynamic time in terms of the nature of the solutions. It's a dynamic time in terms of the expectations that enterprise software to schools and universities will match the consumer experience that students are used to. Like if you go to register class in college, 
like you expect a smart experience, right? You expect to say, I'm a sociology major and I've taken these three classes. Yeah. And then boom, it'll recommend students like you take these. Th- That's not, right? How many administrative experiences do we know yeah. fail to match anything close to consumer experiences? All right. I want to go back to you getting your PhD. What did you get your PhD in? Sociology of education. Okay. And then so did you, totally unrelated to Did you start teaching tech and after I did. That? Okay. Yeah. And where at and how? ASU. So that's, what brought, oh, that, me, that's, that's what, what, what brought me here. Okay. So my wife grew up here. Um, and Blackboard actually had an office here relatively early um, up, uh, up in Deer Valley through an acquisition that we did. And we obviously at ASU, we had great customers here. Um, but moved here to be a tenure track professor at, at ASU. Oh, very cool. Yeah. And, and then what caused you to leave that? Or have you left that? Or did you just... Uh, I did. So I was there... Um, for two years, I taught sociology of education and research methods. And it was always funny because you could tell there were one or two students who did a little bit of their homework on their professor. And so I'd get like a random <laughs> business student. Right. And I'm like, I don't, just so you know, we're going to be talking about like Marx and Durkheim and Weber. And, you know, I'm not so sure you're interested in this class. And then I would do this final lecture. So everything about like no one takes social ed because they're going to be a sociologist of education, right? So I would say, look, you're, you're taking this class. <clears throat> My goal for this class is that you will leave being able to write well, speak well, think analytically, and be comfortable with numbers. Write well, speak well, think analytically, be comfortable with numbers. And sociology of education is the context. And if it opens up your mind to think about education differently, I mean, all that stuff is wonderful. Um, And then my final lecture was tying those skills back to what made me an entrepreneur, right? That I could get up and I could pitch the idea and I could write the business plan and I could convince angel investors and, you know, speak well, write well, think analytically, be comfortable with numbers. And it was always amazing, like at the end, they, they were just shut. Like, you start a blackboard? Does anyone did Google you, their professor? Did anymore? you hide that information from them? I never that? mentioned it. Okay, that's never awesome. Never mentioned it from day one. Wow. It was just a regular professor and partly because I'm just a relatively, hopefully humble person. It just wasn't relevant. Right. But then at the end, it was relevant because I was trying to make the case for you know, social sciences, developing skills that, yes, of course, you know, there's and, not many sociology and that's when jobs. Mind blew, right? Like, right? They're like, holy. But how many great <laughs> entrepreneurs do we know that have those degrees? Right. And it's the analytical thinking, it's the things that those degrees develop. So I'm a huge believer in social science degrees and liberal arts education. And then they're like, yeah, wow, like you are a business. Like, why are you here? And, yeah. you know, and, and they hear about like what, what Blackboard sold for. Um, when we went private. Then they're like, wow, you don't need this job. Right, you you know, must be a good doing, teacher. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, that, you know what? I hadn't thought of that. It probably made me more, um, yeah, more sincere. Um, but, I, but again, just the punchline was like, don't any of you Google your professors? Right, right. You know, this is a little bit before Rate My They probably professor. don't care. To, I mean, like, you know, they, they sign up for a class that they figure that they need to get for their degree or whatever. Probably time of day. Yeah, and it's like way more interesting to be on other aspects of social media than Googling who your professor is. But Exactly. So I taught that and then I taught research methods uh, for, for two years. Yeah. Um, and cool. then we'll get into the parchment story. But I continued to teach more like an adjunct for a couple of semesters. But, you know, then parchment is all in. Before we switch to parchment, what was ASU like? Um, have you liked everything that? Uh, Absolutely loved it. I mean, I've I've been to. I mean, I, maybe I've been to over a thousand campuses in my career. I've been to a lot of campuses, um, and I've read a lot of mission statements. I've read a lot of strategic plans. I've met a lot of presidents. ASU really is, um, what my what President Crow describes. ASU really is. Yeah. Just this uniquely dynamic entrepreneurial place. And sometimes that's, you know, got its downsides because, you know, universities are used to being very structured and traditional and slow moving. So when you try to push it at that pace, stuff happens. Um, But uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly dynamic place. It was just awesome to uh, to be part of the faculty. Everyone seems to have extremely positive things to say about what Michael Crow has done to ASU. Uh, in in the past, it's been almost twenty years now, right? Like, what what year did he come in? Like two thousand four. I mean, I first met him in nineteen ninety nine, and he had probably been there. I, I don't think he was at ASU yet in ninety nine, was he? I met him pretty early in the Blackboard days, which is why I guess ninety nine. Maybe it was a few years later. 
I'm trying to think, was he already there in 2001? Oh, no, like, you know what? No, I was there with a guy named Peter Siegel, so that would have been more like 2004, 2005. Yeah, I, I think he came in later, but but in any case, he's, he's done um, what seems like a phenomenal job, both growing ASU and changing its reputation from a party school to a school that's like, generating some real research and, you know, you know, doing incredible things. So Yeah, but the most important thing that he did is he blew up the notion that it's all about status. Or more specifically, he redefined status. Right. Status isn't about how many kids you reject. Status isn't about how selective you are. Right. Status right. is about whether you're innovative. And status is about your ability to impact students' lives at scale. And that really did, and I assume does, um, pervade the place. And as a faculty member, when you're getting that signal, yeah. that your job isn't just to sort of cream the top of your students who are most engaged and fascinated in sociology of education, but your job is to help the student. And there were these students who couldn't write for their life, and it was just painful getting through two pages, and actually take the time to mark it up and sit down and make them a better writer, hopefully as a sociology professor, like that. That's awesome. Yeah, that, uh, very cool. All right, so let's get into the Parchment story. Um, you actually discovered the company that became Parchment, right? Like uh, there was some, some, somebody already doing something along those lines. Um, well, why don't, why don't I let you tell the story rather than me sort of? <laughs> yeah, so in, um, oh gosh, when was it? I think it's around 2001. I, I edited a book and I wrote a chapter. And this gets into your uh, so it was 20 years ago, so it was 2001. Um, I wrote a chapter and I made five predictions of how education, how technology was going to change education. And precisely because it was slow moving, I thought to myself, all right, I'm going to make all these predictions like 20 years from now. Right. And now it actually is 20 years from now. And one of those predictions was the basic idea of, of parchment, that um, credentials are a coin of the realm, right? right? It's this way that we denominate human capital. Not just academic credentials, but professional credentials, certifications, licenses. They're part of tech. They're part of finance. They're part of health. Yeah. You know, licenses are how you practice professions. So credentialing is one of those things that's pervasive in our economy, in our educational system, applying to college, transferring, going on to graduate school. Um, and yet there's no platform that allows individuals to be able to collect and manage their credentials in one place across their lives. And for some, you may never ever go back to your transcript and who cares. But for others, you are in fields where credentialing is a very active and continuing part of your life. Um, and at the same time, most credentials are pretty analog and dumb. Like a transcript tells you courses and grades and credits, which isn't can you write well, speak well, think analytically, or be comfortable with numbers. Right. right? A diploma tells you less than a prisoner of war can share under the Geneva Convention, right? Like name, <laughs> rank, and serial number. And that's not, I didn't invent that line. Someone else did. Um, and so, you know, this idea of could a technology platform do two things at once? One, just make credentialing work better and empower individuals to own and, and use their credentials and gain insights from their credentials data. And two, transform credentials. Make them much better representations of human capital, uh, whether it's for enrollment or for employment career development, just make credentials much more uh, meaningful. And so that was the sort of the prediction that technology will transform the content of credentials, the insightfulness of credentials, and will make credentials much more actionable um, in the processes of, of uh, admissions and employment. And that's what Parchment's all about, turning credentials into opportunities. So um, actually at the first, first or second ASU GSV summit, which is this huge ed tech kind of, it's a mix of a banking conference and like a Woodstock, it's like everything thrown in together. Okay. All these education investors and ed tech companies and schools and universities come together. I came across a company in LA that was doing something a little bit like what I imagined Parchment, fell in love with it. First it was, can I invest? Then it was, can I join the board? And then it was a little bit obnoxious. Can I be the CEO of the company? <laughs> Which is obnoxious since I'm talking to the CEO of the company. Um, but I mean, it was he gave me permission to ask that question, and then you know became parchment, and we're off to the races. Awesome. So give a couple of uh, like practical examples of what your customers are doing with parchment. Like, is your customers the average Joe, or is it institutions? Is it both? Um, is it doctors who need to sort of put their credentials on their walls? Yeah. Like, what, 
Tell us a little bit about it. So we are today primarily focused on educational credentials. So schools and universities, transcript certificates, diplomas, digital badges, things like that. Not as okay. much the licensing side yet. Um, if you think about a, a high school student, um, they can request their transcript mm -hmm. and they can do it online instead of going to Mrs. Schneider's you know, desk and giving her petty cash. And okay. you know, Mrs. Schneider, instead of having all this paperwork, has a very simple streamlined interface. By the, Mrs. Schneider, obviously being our prototypical Ad, guidance counselor or administrator, yeah. um, you know she can just pull the record right out of the SIS, produce it. By the way, the university admissions office, which we also have products for, are not getting printed and mailed transcripts that could get lost in the mail or envelopes inside of envelopes, but they're getting an electronic data feed or a PDF directly from that school. Okay. So it makes things more efficient for them where they can, A, have the security of point-to-point -point exchange, but also be able to evaluate it more efficiently. So for the student, it's getting ordered quickly. And then we can tell students with our data, which are the colleges that you might want to consider applying to. What are your statistical odds of getting into each of the colleges on your list? We have a Monte Carlo simulation that tells uh -huh. you how likely you are to get into one school on your list or two schools or three schools. We can dynamically sort your list by stretch, target, and safety based on those probabilities. So it allows the learner to get more insights from that record and from the process data, the metadata. It makes things more efficient for the admissions office, and it makes things more efficient and secure for the, the student. school. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so how uh, like how does the, the back end work? Does the school have to do the high schools and um, uh, universities have to be a Parchment customer first in order for students to be able to access their records through Parchment? Yes. Or, okay. So it's and a little bit like an open table experience where if the restaurant's not on there, we'll say sorry. Gotcha. And Chaparral is, but for example, Chaparral High School is you know not on Parchment. Okay. If Chaparral High School is, then they'll see Chaparral storefront. Gotcha. You can actually use some of the admissions tools without being a on customer. the platform. You just have to fill out a bunch more forms. And then what percentage of high schools are on Parchment now? So we are, um, we're roughly a third of high school enrollments. Okay. That's pretty good penetration. Are, yeah, a and are being serviced. Are the other two thirds on a different platform similar to Parchment or are they still going the paper? It's a little bit of a complicated story um, because even though, so, so, so those are schools who are using us directly. And then if you think of us as like a network where we have a network of schools and universities where we're exchanging these records, even our competitors, we have... Um, about 95% of the admissions offices have an account with Parchment to collect and process. Okay. And so one of the things we did early on is say, look, even if we're not able to get a school district to use us and they have some substitution from us, let's work with those other platforms so they deliver through our network as well. Okay. So now getting a little bit more in the weeds, you can use Parchment directly because your school uses it, or you might still be using us through a different product that – you're ordering it through them, but when they're delivering it to ASU, they're actually sending Going it over parchment. to Parchment to send it. So we have a wholesale retail gotcha. back-end, front-end distinction. And in that sense, we cover a much larger percentage of the market when it comes to kind of our, our transcript volume. And then in higher ed, you know, we work with the registrar's office. And so if you get a diploma now, you won't just get a printed diploma. You'll get a digital diploma. You can put it on LinkedIn. You can use it as a way of verifying your degree because it's a secure PDF that can be verified back at the university's website. Um, the universities get to understand what people request their transcripts for. Is it transfer? Is it employment? Who are the top employers that require academic transcripts as part of the hiring process? So again, it's a mixture of insights and, and, and efficiency and security. That's a really interesting use case I hadn't thought of. So like someone who says, hey, I have a bachelor's degree in computer science or whatever and puts it on their LinkedIn, you guys can actually say like, uh, provide some sort of seal or something on, on LinkedIn that says, yeah, this person really does have a bachelor's of... Exactly. It's a way of, of trusting that claim on, on LinkedIn. Um, for the universities, it's also marketing. Right. Because if you say, look, I just completed this, um, you know, this Microsoft certification at the community college and I got their certificate and you share that, then your network gives you, you know, high fives, congratulations. Some percentage of them are like, oh, I hadn't thought about going to the community college. Yeah. So it turns your graduates into promoters of your program. It allows your graduates to provide a verified claim about their educational achievement. It gives you insights into how your credentials are being used. So that's, it's a multifaceted value prop. That's awesome. 
And how successful or how how big is Parchment now? Like how many people do you share revenues? What what can you share with us in terms of like yeah? So we don't that it, we we don't share uh, revenues, but we're now about two hundred and seventy five people. Wow, we're very profitable. So you can sort of work to what you might imagine. Yeah. you know, kind of ARR per headcount. So we are, you know, we're more in the kind of keep size okay. um, of the spectrum okay. in terms of, in terms of Re- ARR. Revenue and ARR, yeah. very cool. And w- w- is there sort of a goal? Do you think that you're building it up for some sort of acquisition or is it going to just keep going like this? Or what, what are your thoughts? We haven't done enough for you yet. I mean, Say good. We, got, we haven't done enough for you yet, Hamid. We gotta keep going. <laughs> no, I uh, love, what have I love you done you. for me lately? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of curious uh, because do you have investors, right? Like once you do. have investors, it's sort of not just entirely up to you, and you might love just doing this forever. And we do, we do. So when um, so that early company, which was called Docufy, that we renamed Parchment and brought here to Phoenix, um, I invested in the original venture investors in uh, Blackboard. Joined me, and we built it. We brought in two new investors over time, but we actually sold the business in 2020. So about a year and a half ago, we sold the business uh, to Brentwood Associates, okay. which is a um, private equity firm out of LA. Gotcha. Actually, fun fact, they own Postinos. Oh, so they got another the restaurant angle. Yeah. What? what? Yeah. That's a weird combination of uh, things. Well, I mean, a lot of private equity firms have, you know, they have their tech team, they have their Restaurant, restaurant team, team, product <laughs> team, whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, where was I going with that? Anyway, so we sold to, to Brentwood. So, so those investors have gotten their exit. It was a pretty good outcome. Um, and so now we're in the you know year and a half or so in with Brentwood to build over their ownership period, which you know most private equity three to five years, maybe five to seven years. Did depending. you sell most of your shares as part of that or? So you, I, I, I rolled a lot of it. So I consider myself a meaningful investor still in, in uh, Parchment. Um, but I also did have a little bit of the exit as well um, okay. from, from that sale. And the Parchment employees who had stock options did, you know, as gotcha. well. Um, and so in some sense, you know, we're the same Parchment and it's a lot of the same leadership team. But we're effectively, a, you know, a new business. A private equity-owned business. Private equity-owned business. And what was really cool is Brentwood already owned our number one competitor in higher education, which is actually a much bigger part of our business than K-12. Um, so part of their acquiring of Parchment was to then merge that company and Parchment together to create what we call the new Parchment and then build that gotcha. you know, forward. And then since then, we've done another acquisition. So this might be a good uh, transition point to... Um, go into talking about ed tech in Arizona because ed tech has become huge in Arizona. And I like, as long as I've known, as uh, long as I've been paying attention, ed tech has been pretty big in Arizona. Like what was the catalyst? Was it because Blackboard came to Arizona and then ed tech took off or did Blackboard come to Arizona because ed tech was already a big thing? You know, these things tend to happen because you've got the genealogy of, you know, you have Dell, which begets a bunch of things, and then you have Austin, right? Right. You've got AOL in Northern Virginia, which begets a bunch of things, and then you have the Northern Virginia technology cluster. And then never just one company, but you get the idea. So here, I really would give the greatest amount of credit to University of Phoenix and Apollo. Oh, so you had a for-profit education providers. You know, you had U- UTI, you have, I mean, now you have Grand Canyon. It right. wasn't what it is now then. Um, you have, but Grand Canyon has a, you know, a lot of that team came out of University of Phoenix. So I do think many years ago, it was the University of Phoenix. Okay. Then you have KnowledgeNet, which, you know, mm. that team went on to create Stormwind. You've got ASU, and ASU has scale and has spun out things that sort of develop. Um, and so I just think you, you know, Blackboard didn't come because of those things. Uh, we came because we acquired a company that happened to have been headquartered here, but we definitely continued to build and viewed this as kind of our main second office because of that ed tech cluster. Yeah. And so now you've got, you know, and a different, you know, some of these have just had exits, but you have Picmonic, you have Campus Logic, you have Stormwind, you have um, Spear Education, which is a pretty significant technology business, yeah. not just the, the live dental training. You obviously have uh, Parchment. You know, there are so many other businesses 
you know, that have flown through as well. So it's it's actually a pretty big cluster. And have you been making investments in some of these companies? I have. So I was an investor in Picmonic, and I know we were both investors, I think, in Campus, Campus Logic. Logic. Yeah, yeah. Which, was, which was a great outcome. And now Greg has Phoenix Ventures, and he's making investments. And even companies that I haven't, you know, and you have Procterio. I just forgot them. I mean, these are going to keep coming to me as we're going yeah. through all the great companies. Not all of them have I, have I invested in. But all of them I try to be a mentor to, to the extent they'd like me to be as well. And I know Greg does. So now you also have the executive talent that can make angel investments, make bridges to national VC conversations, but also give them that mentorship. And you've got talent as well to recruit. What what are you most excited about in the um, ed tech space in Arizona? Um. I guess I don't want to name names. <laughs> Why not? That's the most fun. <laughs> so, I mean, Picmonic. Look, I mean, Campus Logic's a great business, and I think Greg's got a ton of a ton of runway there. Um, you know, I, I just love Picmonic. Yeah. You know, and you know they, they recently they, sold yeah, to, uh, to, to say. True Learn. I think it was True Learn. Okay. Um, and uh, and I think it's going to be a tremendous platform for them and for the entrepreneurs. You know, to be able to build off of it, but you know. I just love that product. I love that platform, that idea of maybe it's that. It, it, did Picmonic ever really take off in a in a in the way that they had hoped, or like, or I, were you on the board, or yeah, okay, in the way that you guys had hoped, or did it sort of like was it struggling? What was the reason for that? I think it did and it didn't. So I think the thing, so Picmonic was very successful with medical students helping them learn high stakes information using that visual mnemonic yeah. kind of study doodle technique, which is awesome. Um, so they had to really prove two things. One is they had to prove that they could um, scale into multiple topic areas. Yeah. And then they had to prove that the platform could organically generate content. And so it, it wouldn't be all kind of their professional, and those two are related, right? Right. We're not going to have to hire a ton of content experts and illustrators to get into every possible thing, that there's a certain critical mass where user-generated Picmonics or professional publishers will adopt the platform, and then it will, you know, they'll kind of help paint the fence for us. Yeah. And so I think they proved elements of user-generated, and they proved they could go into the broader allied health market. Um, what they weren't able to get to with the capital that they, you know, had access to um, was to sort of break beyond mm. beyond medicine. And so at a certain point, I don't know if I would call it a pivot, there was that epiphany where that's okay. Like we actually have a profitable, super successful, impactful business yeah. in health. And health is a huge e-learning market. Yeah. And we can build something very valuable for a strategic acquirer or a financial sponsor. And that's what ended up happening. So it was a very successful outcome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, what else do you invest in outside of ed tech? What are you excited about? So I only invest in ed tech. Really? Yes. Well, you should know this because I told you this. <laughs> and I regret it since um, I have not had the benefit to ride your coattails oh, no. with some of your success. Um, but for better or for worse, and in this case, your case, definitely for worse, um, I only invest in ed tech. Partly because I don't feel necessarily qualified to um, to evaluate other things as well. So no, and partly because I'd like to think, you know, that's where I could add the most value. And so if I'm going to invest, I want it to be in a space where I could add the most value. What, what about outside of startups? Do you invest in any public companies or um, cryptocurrency or anything like that? You've just completely stayed out of all of that? No. You know, one of the things when you when – you, um, so this is funny because it reminds me of how we started our conversation when you say go back into what faculty you were like. So we're on the IPO Roadshow, and we're visiting a very big uh, public uh, investor who will go nameless. And we're meeting with actually a relatively young analyst. And we're, you know, when you do the Roadshow, you've got your pitch book. And legally, you want to be almost to the word repeating the same script over and over again. So right. you, know, you have 10 to 15 meetings in a day, and you're doing the exact same thing the same corny jokes, the same handoff <laughs> moment. And by the end of it, we're all just killing each other by like taking each other's lines before the other one can mm. or screwing up the transition point. So you, 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 start, you, know, you start having these fun things. Anyway, we're meeting with one 
And like, and I'm doing my part and I'm, you know, I don't know in this interview, but I'm usually relatively plain spoken and talking about it. Like, you know, Blackboard software, if you were to go back to school today, you know, instead of your teacher handing out a syllabus, you would download it from a website, whatever. Um, and Mike actually could tell that he was clueless. Like he had no idea what we did. So he stopped and he said, and I swear to God, he said, you know that thing called the internet? <laughs> and I like, I froze up, our CFO, like, I think you just like insulted this guy. <laughs> and he said, but in all sincerity, he was like, yeah, yeah, no, I know the internet. He goes, you know how there are web pages on the internet? He goes, yeah, yeah, I visited some of those web pages. Like, have you ever downloaded a document from the internet? I'm like, oh my God, we're like treating this kid like an imbecile. But it turned out that actually uh, was his level of functioning in the conversation. Um, anyway, after going through the roadshow and seeing who manages the, uh, public, the, company. the public company money, <laughs> I think I like took everything and put it in like tax-free municipal bonds. I mean, maybe well, not literally, well, uh, but I'm actually one of those people who believes you put things in um, index funds, and then you and, and I'm young, if, if ish, it, so you would then ignore them, yeah, and you don't try to do anything else. And so my, um, yeah, okay. So uh, investing in index funds, I, I can't fault you there, but you should think that at least you could do better than that guy who, <laughs> who had to be True. explaining explained to what the internet was. I have my own little portfolio that does uh, All right. that does reasonably well. But have you gotten excited about things like Tesla or anything like that? Um, gosh, what a, I mean, I'm still fundamentally an Apple fan. Yeah, which I know so at this point is you, a little uh, bit of a cliche, and I was very early on. Okay, so and you just I held on to a lot. I benefited okay. a lot from That's awesome. actually some of my early um, secondary selling at Blackboard went into. Apple, but when you think about the scale of the markets in which they're now operating, whether it's health or fitness, yeah. entertainment, you know, it's just it's this incredible act when it comes to, I mean, I do wish, you know, the innovation engine, but it's easier to say that, you know, um, uh, when it's at this scale and operating across the number. Any number of things that they're doing now back then would have been a huge thing, right. but it gets lost in the scale of what they're doing. But I'm still a huge... Uh, Apple fan. Actually, I've kind of soured on Tesla a little bit. Yeah, uh, I am a Tesla driver. I have okay. been for a long time. And what's like, the, what's the reason you've soured? I mean, this is like high class problems to have. Yeah. But it's pretty, it's pretty glitchy now. You mean the autopilot? I feel like things are constantly crashing. I'm constantly rebooting it. Oh, it's died a couple of times. And I am a little bit interested in the idea that Lucid is built in Arizona. Yeah, I think it'd be very cool to have a, a car built in your hometown. I think it's also good to have competition. Yeah. It's good for Tesla to have that competition. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I want the competition to be good, not Nikola, which was like very, you know, they, they were rolling their truck downhill type of thing. But Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, this gets back to the steal the chair. There's an yeah, extreme exactly. to how far you go and, and sort of. Going back to uh, the, the uh, conversation about Elizabeth Holmes and um, – uh, the, the name of the company is escaping. Theranos. Theranos, thank you. Uh, Theranos, I mean, those guys were not just uh, sort of projecting the future as this optimistic thing. They were they were also lying about the past of what they had accomplished already. And, oh, yeah. I, and I think that's a big sort of no-no when it comes to sort of like misrepresenting reality. Yeah. Right? So it's viewed as this sort of um, judgment of the Silicon Valley, fake it till you make it, right. speak aspiration, uh, aspirationally, self-fulfilling prophecy type stuff. But I really do think it's such an extraordinary example. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're giving people blood test results right. that right. are inaccurate is is a little different. A and you're using sort of like traditional machines to find the results. And you're and completely lying about the yeah. military examples and, <laughs> you know, so much more of that. So, you know, the piece that I... I find magical today is marketing technology, you know. So oh, we talk about we talk about um, you know the old tech stack, right? Which was your database, your app. Oh, so that was it. Actually, it was your database, your application server, right? Right. Um, the operating system. The operating system of the server, and then maybe the programming language. And now it's a hundred million things. Like marketing used to be three people, right? It was like the person who did the sales powerpoints. Yeah. It's like the person who maybe like managed the website, maybe like a PR person, right? You know. Um, created brochures, our marketing tech stack is like 18 different, yeah. 80 different products. And what it can do, like I think Optimizely is like magical. <laughs> like I can stand up an entire alternative Version experience of, of my product with like almost no engineering. 
Like, yeah. that's just magical. Yeah. Some of the stuff is obviously very creepy. Like, I can tell exactly who's read what, you know, and track How much them. time they've spent in yeah, it. Yeah. And, and what you know, buttons they clicked and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah. It and, feels and so intrusive when you're on the other. It you feels know, very like, intrusive. You're sort of deciding, is it okay for me to be collecting this information? <laughs> right. And are you doing it on me? And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, so I've been doing a little bit of, yeah. So I'm, I'm really interested in. And I mean, I know it's a hard space to be successful in, but I think the nature of those solutions is just pretty magical. If you weren't running Parchment and you weren't going to do something in ed tech, what would be the area that you'd be getting into right now? Like, would you be getting into AI or, you know, like marketing stack or some sort of yeah. marketing tool? Or No, I would what? teach. I mean, the thing that... Teach? I, yeah, I would teach, but... So that's thing- your love that you, you keep going back to. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing like being in a classroom with 30 students and introducing an idea and then taking them on a journey. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like any, unlike anything in the world. That's awesome. And would you teach the same thing that you had taught in the past? Well, that's or? the only thing I'm qualified to teach now. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would teach that. And I wouldn't teach like, you know, entrepreneurship. Not that I don't think you can teach entrepreneurship, but I think if you're going to teach entrepreneurship, it's not you were an entrepreneur. It's like you really understand that literature. So for me, yeah, it's it's sociology. And I love sociology. I love getting people to think about the world differently. And, you know, and especially in this day and age, right, when, you know, people bristle at the, no- at the notion that there's systemic right. racism and that there are powers above, you know, individuals um, or forces. But um, I had this experience where I was signing up for um, – I was signing up for YouTube TV because we dropped uh, Cox. Um, And I started using an email address that I never realized I had signed up for another Google service with. And I type it in and say, you already have a service. And then I reset the password. And it turns out, I totally forgot about this. And this also might be a little bit illegal. Um, (laughs) But when I had left Blackboard, I took all my email. Okay. And hopefully I was like, as a founder, I had got special dispensation. right? right? I have a story there. Yeah. So I took all my email. Um, and these were emails that are like 1997, 1998 emails right. in 2000. So again, these aren't like sensitive, confidential uh, documents. And that's why, because in our generation, like our life was an email, like yeah. my dating, my letters and all of that. And I had that experience of realizing that email is designed very good for sending, composing, sending, receiving email. It's designed terribly for experiencing and organizing email. Yes. And so... In there, I started, I will admit, I started to go down the entrepreneurs. Like, what would an email, and there are people working on this on the margins, and partly it's a generational problem because the equivalent of email now is social platforms and text messaging. So, like, today's kids are probably not. Which is even worse from an organization. From from an organization. But I have all these incredible memories and correspondences. Yeah. And so what would an application that took all the email off of, the different cloud services, and had primarily the goal of organizing and helping you curate and discover your email. And we all have that experience of going back into email. And I've ultimately, I mean, A, because parchment. B, I became convinced by people I trust that it is a little bit of a generational problem. I mean, there's a corporate version of it that gets into like legal discovery and other aspects of it. But that is the thing that I noodle on a little bit from time to time. That is definitely that I have now given to your podcast audience. <laughs> if they think it's a good idea, give me a chance to invest at the very least. Yeah. So if, if you, if you have an email related idea that uh, could potentially help people di- rediscover their emails or maybe organize them better, ping uh, ping Matt, Matt. But did you have a similar experience? Is that what you were? Well, well, the, just that email is such an important thing and has been like. For 20 years, I've been using the same email address, hamidas at axosoft.com. Yeah. That was my email address when I sold the company. Um, like last minute thing, as I was, you know, we were going through the paperwork, I realized I'm going to lose this email address. And I had to work it into the contract that I could have access to it for six months. And <laughs> and then even that was like uh, a complicated thing. And we had to sort of negotiate me having the email. It was... It was very interesting, and like, um, it was a traumatic event actually to have to change my email address. It, it was changing my identity to some yeah. to some degree. Well, I was going to say that's what gets into self sovereign identity and this yeah. notion that it is kind of weird 
that our identity is largely through these commercial services. Yeah. Whether it's Google or Facebook. Right. You know, or when you're a student, your EDU and Shibboleth, which is the global authentication in higher ed. It's weird that your identity is tied or your employer right. to that. And then you lose your identity as you're moving unless yeah. you create. So, yeah. And, and then, I, of course, I had to sort of recreate, like, re update all of the accounts that I've ever signed up for everywhere mm. it was for 20 years, which is a lot of freaking accounts. And then, you know, who knows who has my email address that I don't know about. So, like, <laughs> I can't update everyone. Um, so now, of course, you know. The good news of the, all that is that I get a lot less junk mail than I used to. So you got a there, reset there was button. A, yeah, yeah, there was a little bit of a, a good aspect there. Um, all right, last thing I want to talk about a little bit. I uh, was looking up your um, Wikipedia profile, and I noticed in there that uh, you started working with computers with an Atari 800. Yes. And that's what I started with. Yes. So that was a lot of fun times back then uh, in the 80s, um, working on those Atari 800s as it's going to date both of us. But then you went to an Atari 1040 ST. Correct. Uh, which I just wanted to remind you was a far inferior product to the Amiga, which is what I went to. I was about to say, <laughs> instead of the Amiga. So I would say sound. I forget like what the debate. Yeah. And the Amiga was sort of the next generation Commodore. Um, right. Yeah. So With better graphics. Off, I don't know what you're doing next weekend, but my Atari 800 is operational and working in my home. Get out of here. So my kids load games with a floppy disk. Wow. And I've that. actually got the cartridge, although the, you know, the cassette was like painful. Um, and uh, yeah, so we play Ultima 2 and Ultima 3 and 4. I love that. And we play... Do you uh, still have your Atari ST too? I still have my Atari ST. Wow. Both are plugged in and... That is really cool. Ready to you go had for the, you. I mean, you know, uh, foresight. Well, to truthfully, over around. time, I've acquired okay. things off of eBay. You know, when things uh, when things break. Um, I loved my Amiga. It, it was just like the. So no, so yeah, so yeah. so so that was a religious war. Yeah, and I was very much on the 1040 ST side, <laughs> but unfortunately, 1040 ST did not get the same amount of software. Amiga won the software. Well, they both battle. Lost. I remember calling, you know the. The local, I forget even what the game stores were, but calling like, is this out yet Yeah. for Atari? And we were like the fourth platform after the IBM, That's after right. Apple. What's crazy is that both the Atari ST and Amiga were far superior to um, the alternative, which was like uh, IBM, which basically destroyed uh, yeah. even the Mac at the time, So, uh, which was kind of crazy. But Yeah, so the 1040 ST had a mouse. It had a graphical user interface. Yeah. And the Amiga had uh, mouse graphical user interface and color, which the ST didn't have. My and ST has color, but maybe the first ones didn't. I okay. don't remember. Okay. Uh, and then uh, it had um, preemptive multitasking, which was a pretty big deal, where you could have multiple applications running simultaneously. I don't think that. I don't think 1040 ST had that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and going down memory lane to some extent. And thanks for making the time. Matt, I appreciate it. You as well. Thank you for reminding me I've gotten old. <laughs> but only as old as you are up here, you know, like uh, all of that is experience that we can use on the next thing that we do. There you go. All, all right. right. Take care. Thank you. All right. You made it to the end of the episode. I would love to get your feedback, so take a moment to leave a genuine review in your favorite podcast app. That also helps us reach more people. Speaking of reach, if you like a particular episode, be sure to share it with someone who you think would enjoy it. See you next time.